Hi, this is Marcus Fares from Design on our special screen time collaboration with Devon and Devon. And we've got two guests today. We've got Nicola Bertini, who's general manager at Devon and Devon. Hi there, Nicola. Hi. Good evening. Tell me, tell me what, can you tell me where you are? That's a fantastic um, wallpaper you've got behind you. Where are you speaking to me from? Here we are in, in Florence, in Firenze. This is the very first showroom ever made of Devon and Devon. So it's the place where everything started for our history. And maybe we are going to talk about it. Yeah, definitely. And then we also have Daniel Stromberg, who's the product development lead at Architect Gensler. Hi, Daniel. Hey, how you doing, Marcus? <laughs> nice to meet you. And Daniel, where are you speaking from? Uh, I'm at my home, uh, like we've all been doing for uh, the last three months in Los Angeles, California. Okay, so we've got a very international triangle going on here. Uh, Nicola, tell us, tell me a little bit about yourself and about the brand Devon and Devon. What is it? What does it do? And what's your involvement? And how long have you been involved? Tell me the whole story. Oh yeah. Uh... I, I'm born here in Tuscan, <laughs> and I'm very happy to, 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 to be in a Florentine-based company. Uh, I entered here in Devon and Devon as a general manager since Devon and Devon was uh, acquired by a very important Italian group uh, that is named the Ital Chair. This was happening some three years ago, uh, and uh, the, the, the company Devon and Devon was therefore able to make uh, a leap from being a Florence-based company uh, to explore a real multinational uh, company, having good shoulders uh, thanks to, to one of the groups that nowadays is in the top five groups in Italy, Italian groups for the ceramics and uh, everything that is related to ceramics. And tell us about the kind of products you make and um, what is the design ethos of those products and, and, and what kind of clients do you have? Where do they get sold or where do they get used? Yeah, uh, historically, and this is part, from the, part of the DNA of the company, uh, Devon and Devon has been always working on, on the total look, starting from the bathroom environment. And when I'm saying total look, it means that, uh, as you were noting, that the wallpaper behind me is part of this total look approach. So we have a, a very extended range of products. Uh, there are elements uh, that designers can use to, to uh, create a full Devon and Devon style uh, place or uh, can take as small pieces for their own uh, specific design in a more eclectic approach. Um, historically, uh, all the, the, the design of the products of Devon and Devon was managed internally, uh, but nowadays being likely the, the 30th years of the company, so it's the 30th anniversary, we open to uh, collaboration with very important architectural firm and the, the one we're discussing about today is Gensler. And we'll get on to Gensler in just a second, but why is it called Devon and Devon? That's a very English <laughs> name. Was it founded by two people from Devon or what's the, what's the origin no, of the name? Exactly. But, but there's some connection with it. Uh, this company, as I was telling you, was born 30 years ago and was founded by two architects that had uh, a business idea very, very interesting uh, and a, a concept of design very interesting that was basically transforming a functional room such as a bathroom into uh, one of the different rooms of the building where you live. And uh, uh, they, they started looking for an approach of uh, uh, nice design and attention to details. And in that particular historical moment, uh, uh, everything was running after, uh, I would say, a kind of a Victorian age style uh, design. And the, the, the connection with uh, Devonshire, with, uh, you know, it, it recalls Tuscany in terms of landscape in a way, 
uh, was making sense with these origins. Ah, so you consider Devon to be the English Tuscany then? Yeah. Yeah, didn't know that. <laughs> Daniel, over to you. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Uh, who do you work for? Tell us about yourself and your company. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I live in Los Angeles. Um, like I said, I'm at my home. Uh, I work for Gensler, which is um, obviously I, I think most your, the people viewing right now likely know who we are. We're a, a rather large architecture and, and primarily interior design firm, but we do a lot of other consulting work, product work like myself. Uh, my own role within there is design director within the uh, product development group. So um, I, I don't do interiors, I don't do architecture. I, I solely focus on product design uh, that's generally solution-based. It was always solution-based, um, based on what we see in the marketplace in terms of areas for innovation, areas for improvement, whether or not it's gonna be price, warranty, aesthetics, performance, whatever it's gonna um, be mandated by the project. And so I've been uh, working with Gensler for about six years now. And how long have you known Nicola? How did you two meet and how did you come together to do the project that we're about to find out about? We met, uh, I think about four, four and a half, five years ago, Nicola, is that about right? Right. Yeah, it's, it, it, he, he was with another lighting company prior to this that, that we've designed a bunch of products for. Um, that's also based out of Florence and um, had a great relationship. And so when he went over to run things at Devon and Devon, um, gave me a call, asked if we were interested in collaborating. Totally different product sector. I've frankly never worked within the um, bath sector before in my life. And so it's, it's provided some really, really great, I guess, um, learning curves, right? Sorry, cut out there for a second. What was that? This is your first bath you've ever designed. One more time. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, you're cutting out a little. I hear you. Let me just try that again. Can you hear me, Daniel? Yep. I, know, I just said it's the first, the first bath you've ever designed. What's the best part that we've designed? No, no, the first bath. Oh, the, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm, I'm deaf here. <laughs> totally. I, no, these are the first baths we've designed. And so that, that provided, I think, um, I, I guess a really interesting uh, launching pad because I don't have, you know, it's, it's primarily my background and, and the team that I work with has really been in furniture because, you know, Gunzer does a, a, we do more interior design work uh, globally than just about anybody else. And as a matter of fact, I think we do more work than anybody else. Uh, so, you know, our, my whole team's background is pretty much embedded within workplace design products, right? And so uh, what I believe is when you get into a different product sector, you can kind of take what you've learned from one sector and then apply it towards another sector that, um, you know, I, I hate the term thinking outside the box, but in essence, it's, it's thinking outside the box because ignorance sometimes is bliss. I mean, you, you ultimately do a lot of research getting into a product uh, market when you enter into it, but you're not, um, I guess, stuck in a modality of having done all these things in the past. And so I think it gives a, a really set of fresh eyes. And that was, I think, to our benefit, and I think Nicola will agree with this, is, is why we were able to, um, frankly, I think, innovate in a product sector, which is bathtubs that, you know, hasn't seen a lot of, a lot of innovation since Kohler introduced a, a, a horse's trough with legs on it back in the late, you know, 19th century. And so, uh, I mean, there's, there's been tons of improvements, don't get me wrong, in terms of materiality and form, but um, where we, where I think we're, we're kind of doing something interesting right now is the fact that, you know, we created this modular bathtub concept um, that we brought to market with Devon. Why don't you share us a presentation and talk us through the work that you do and um, oh, yeah. the products that you've done with Gensler, which sure. I'm Devon and Devon. Yeah, so. Boom. All right. You guys uh, see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, okay. So um, I kind of first thought it, it'd be important, uh, and I touched upon this earlier, is that you know we're an architecture and interior design firm, and and one of the things, the reason I came to Gensler, uh, you know, a number of years ago was was really because of the fact that you know we've got. 6,000 employees around the world that I can tap into for research. And I think um, to do good design and to do thoughtful um, design of any sort, really, you know, you, you tapping into uh, expertise, whatever that's going to mean, 
uh, is, is quintessential and key to, to developing good product. And so I'll show a couple of different types of projects really quick that we, we have worked on recently um, and, and how I guess the story came about in terms of what we delivered without diving into too deep. This is, this is a system we developed with another Italian company called Fantoni. It was Atelier. Uh, we launched it last year and it's, it's a really interesting project because of the fact that it addressed a client need um, clients need insofar as introducing products that were mobile, highly mobile, hypermobile even, uh, as well as uh, super flexible, right? And so um, this was something that we tested in our own offices in London, was the first place we did installation for. It's, it's great that we can test our own things and our own projects that we live in, in essence, all the time. Um, and yeah, so this, this launched last year. It was, we got some nice accolades from the design community as well. It was shortlisted for the award last year. Uh, but really, it was a focus on uh, the flexibility and mo mobility versus uh, this product, which is uh, an American company called Stylex that ultimately we um, brought to market last year as well at Neocon. We launched it. And this is, this is again, addressing about flexibility, but it's flexibility in a very different way of a, from a planning standpoint. And it's, you know, the, the idea that we have tied over a lot of the thinking that we learned on these projects to the Devon project in terms of modularity. Uh, in terms of flexibility, you know, what's been interesting about coming to Genzer is that I, I had no idea, having not worked with so many interior designers before, um, the need for customization. It really doesn't matter how perfect of a product you believe you've launched in the market. The reality is, is that someone's always going to want to change it. And uh, to be able to bring something that accepts that and adopts that up front, right, and can account for that in terms of how it's manufactured, right? Because ultimately what, what my role is and my team's role is, is to produce something for somebody like a Devon that is you know, easily manufactured at the same time, easily customizable without having to open new molds or do things that are outside the norm um, you know, in regards to uh, what the designers of the end users are gonna want. So you know, the collaboration that, that we got forward with, or came forward with Devon was, the brief that we were given from Devon was based on, uh, we were asked to produce something that uh, ultimately had some sort of Art Deco reference because we're seeing a resurgence right now, you know, quite large in, in Art Deco or, you know, historically referential furniture, right? Because um, let's be totally honest, there's so much furniture out there. Do we need more product? Probably not. And this is coming from someone who, who designs this stuff. Uh, and so how do we do something differently? How do we do something innovative? How do we do something at the same time that's timeless, that isn't, um, so temporally based that it's, uh, or, or even so thematically based. So, you know, we looked at, you know, part of um, the research was, you know, diving into this Art Deco movement and what Art Deco meant, you know, it kind of, it bifurcates into, you know, a couple different camps, but the, the area that we were ultimately were really interested in was this concept of, of streamlined modern and how, uh, from the standpoint of, um, just simple geometry, you know, I'm a big fan of, of, of keeping it simple stupid. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that I, I like simple, simple shapes. Uh, and we were, there was, there was something really interesting and, and, and alluring about some of the forms that came out of, and something also, frankly, very American, which was, is a huge departure for Devon in terms of uh, how they chose to collaborate us, right? We're, we're in, in many ways an international firm, but we're, we're founded in America. And so the American spin that we had on, on the, on, um, Streamline Modern ultimately you know, really informed the form language that we were going for. And so, you know, we looked at uh, a strictly Art Deco type referential um, design. And we know that, you know, we, as, as Genzer, you know, part of, part of what our, if you want to call it an ad services, is that, you know, we, we ultimately like to be able to specify the products that we've designed ourselves, right? And that's, that's part of why we do what we do from a from a business standpoint, right? There's business and the design, obviously. But the notion that having a tub that could be flexible, that could work in a myriad of environments, uh, spaces, whatever those those typologies might be, that could create a really unique experience at the same time, um, talk to what you might call the familiar, the familiar form, the familiar design language. And um, it kind of led us down this uh, kind of a, a, a split path, if you will, right? How do we create something that is uh, going to satisfy this, this idea of Art Deco and at the same time be flexible enough to get outside of that and, and speak a very contemporary design language? And so we came up with this uh, modular approach. And uh, frankly, it was partially due to the fact that there were two tubs that we liked in the development process and we wanted to do both of them. Um, and so we came up with this notion that, you know, if we 
in essence, have uh, a kit of parts, right? Like this proverbial, proverbial kit of parts that everyone always talks about, but this notion that you have a couple different tub designs and a couple different vessel designs that are in essence based on the same mold. Um, you can have a really expansive collection that allows all the customization that designers at the end of the day want. And a lot of that comes through materiality and, and, and color, right? So we came forward at the end of the day you know, throughout the development process. We ended up with two different uh, form languages for the tub inserts. One's called the dub, one's called the holiday. Uh, the dub is a very contemporary, um, clean aesthetic to it. You know, it's not overly ornamental, but at the same time, it has these subtle curves that reference back to uh, the Art Deco period versus the holiday tub insert, which, uh, you know, in speaking to our the interior designers that were working on hotels or hospitality crew, uh, there was an ask that they were saying is, you know, how do we have deck mounted taps and faucets without having to have an access door in the back? And it becomes a huge issue from a maintenance standpoint, from an installation standpoint for hotel developers to have the style of a freestanding Roman tub without having to have a freestanding unattached uh, plumbing fixture. And so part of what we were, I guess, tasked internally within Gunther was to, how, do, how do we figure out how to solve that? Um, and so we came up with this, uh, basically a two-part system where we have the vessel, which is the shell, and you'll see in the next slide, uh, and then the inserts, right? And so, and what became interesting is that during the development process, we were really kind of thinking myopically in terms of a, of a Roman tub, right? Just one outside that you could plop two insides inside of. Um, and it wasn't until we did the first prototype review, uh, you know, in Italy, flew out there that we saw this insert, the dove insert, kind of standing by itself off on the factory floor. It hadn't been put into a vessel yet that we realized that there was, if we redesign that insert, it can in fact become a standalone tub. So I like to call it happy accents that, you know, we ultimately came up with this notion that we could have yet a, you know, tertiary solution for this that would be a standalone tub and then reference back to some of these classic clawfoot, you know, or uh, old school tubs that, you know, we're very familiar with from a design standpoint. Um, just some process shots in terms of how this thing goes together because I think it, it helps explain the story where uh, it's the it's a solid surface material called white tech that uh, Devin uses in uh, cast material and super robust cleanable fixable all that kind of stuff and I'm sure Nicola can can speak to it far more intelligently than I can uh, but it's a beautiful material to work with uh, it's super flexible it allowed us to do exactly what you're seeing here uh, where we create um, in essence, this, this system, right? Uh, the tub that you're seeing here is called the Holiday, which has the deck mounted faucets you can see mounted on the deck and back. Um, this one has the solid surface plinth, which was another uh, potential that we wanted to bring forward in terms of customization is how do you, how do you allow someone to have something slightly more ornamental, right? So we have this plinth and this is uh, part of the casting itself versus you can have it also wrapped in calicata marble, you know, one of the great things about working with Devin is also that they're based on this area that is, you know, one of the hearts of some of the best marble in the world. Um, so we have a cladding, a ring in essence that allows you to customize it and really kind of create this luxurious uh, bath component. Or we can take off that plinth entirely and it sits directly on the, on the, the ground. And so it's a much, much more modern aesthetic. And so, yes, yeah, so we came up with, the, you know, this is a, this is a really a great, I guess, you know, showing of, of the products that we we came up with frankly this is the holiday it's got the it's got an optional marble ring on it that's got a, a slight groove pattern yet again referencing back to uh the deco period same thing with the lip the lip was something that we uh, it's always one of those funny things from a designer standpoint how, how long you labor on these seemingly you know ridiculous details down the road but at the time like you know it becomes this obsession how much do you do you know uh, and then likewise, you know, that same tub can be morphed into a totally different animal here, uh, which is a much cleaner, much more modern aesthetic, and again, fit into a whole host of, of spaces that otherwise, um, you know, the holiday might not be appropriate for. And then the, the one that I'd love is this little guy here, which is the freestanding, which was the insert that was the happy accident where uh, we were able to go back and resurface some of the, the geometry, specifically in the foot, and, and the drain, which you can't really see here in back, but um, sort of very purposely remodel it in, in the hopes of, of taking it into a separate product. And so, yeah, so that's our, that's our collection that we are launching. Great, thank you.
Thank you very much. Can you answer your screen? Yep. I think I figured out what the sound problem was. I think I have my Bluetooth earphones. So I'm going to take them off. Can you hear me now? Not much better. Much. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Let's play, let's play an Apple on it. Brand new <laughs> AirPods. I only used them three times. We figured out, at least we've got, we solved what the problem was. Thanks for that. Nicola, maybe I could bring you in now to talk a bit, a little bit about how you make the product. Because Daniel there was, was talking about solid surface materials and marble and things like that. Do you have your own production facilities? How do you, how do you make a, a bath? How do you make something that big that has to have such kind of high finish on it? Well, that chisel work. Industrial setup is pretty much similar to that of a fashion industry. So, of course, dealing with different technologies. So, the, the White Tech Plus that Daniel just mentioned, uh, or on the other hand, marble, it implies that we, we take marble from caves. You can easily understand that uh, we uh, are working with uh, craftsmen uh, here in the surroundings of Florence uh, that are specialized. Uh, in, in the different technology. So uh, our effort is, uh, uh, of course, in the design, is in the quality control, is uh, in, in, uh, in the R&D in general terms. Uh, and then uh, we uh, integrate this different uh, knowledge that has been uh, developed here in the territory and uh, uh, we arrive to the final product. But you have your own factories or do you work with lo local craftspeople? We, we do have our factory here in Florence, yes. And then, of course, we, we work and we source the material with, uh, from, uh, from different uh, partners that are specialized in specific technologies. And this notion of having a, a tub that sits inside a plinth and then can also then sit inside a a box is that I've not seen that before. I'm I'm not an expert on on bathrooms, but is that something quite quite new? Dan, I, I, am I answering or are you, are you answering? <laughs> I, I'm answering from, from my side. Uh, I think it's totally new in the way it has been designed. Uh, I mean, one one of the the requirements of the colleagues of the, of the uh, Daniel in Gensler was very clear to find a technical solution, enabling to hide all the, 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 the technical paraphernalia and pipes and whatever, and in, in an elegant way. Uh, and uh, it was not an easy task, I would say. And that is really innovative. And using uh, an innovative material enable us to realize a specific uh, design task. Yeah, I would. And, and, and Nicola, um, when, when people are uh, installing baths in, in hotels and places like that, is it a, a presumably it's a, a big demand for them to not be able to see the stuff? And is that for visual reasons or is that for cleaning reasons? What is the, what is the driver behind that, the, the monolith approach? I would say that everything you say is a good reason for that. Um, but I, I would go back to the origins of Devon and Devon, to what I was telling you is uh, the DNA of this company. If you want to transform a room from a functional area to a place where you live, you have to take care of every single detail. And uh, we, we strongly believe uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the intelligence of the people we work with. And this is uh, probably one of the best reasons why uh, we strongly wanted to work with, uh, with Gensler because uh, finding a solution that no one finds so far in such an elegant way was very important for us. Maybe it will be noted uh, visually by, by the users of, of, uh, uh, of an hotel. Maybe not, but and it will work just uh, uh, on a different uh, psychological level, but uh, it will be perceived. Taking care of, uh, of details uh, and working on that is something that is uh, enhancing 
the, 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 the perception, whether you, you perceive it with your eyes or not, you will feel it. So we, this is our approach uh, in, in terms of care of, uh, uh, of details. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, Marcus, Marcus real, real quick, I think, I think there's another, everything is dead, dead right, but I think there's another very programmatic reason why this is important from a specification standpoint, which again is sort of where our internal team came in, is that it, it, in a lot of hotels in America, at least, uh, there's a, there's, it's, a, it's a kind of a funny thing, but it's a point system that's applied when cleaning crews come into spaces and by having uh, a very clean surface that they can you know, clean quickly and efficiently um, becomes, I guess, a driver in a lot of specifications for hotels. And so having that capability of, of having a low point clean product that has deck monitor, all that kind of stuff becomes, from a, a specification standpoint, becomes a really a strong driver on, on why we would want to specify that. Uh, but why go down the approach of having a tub that sits inside the plinth? Because you've, you've got two baths then effectively. Why not have one model that has the plinth and one model that doesn't have the plinth? Is there a kind of an efficiency or a manufacturing benefit to having these two separate components? Oh, yeah, I mean, because basically you've got, the, you've got the, the shell, right? The shell has the plinth attached to the bottom in the mold, but it can be cut off. Or, you know, there's different manufacturing techniques where they kind of shut that off so they don't mold with it. Uh, but that becomes a shared part, right? And so it's you're not doing redundant products in terms of manufacturing processes, if that, that answers your question. And Daniel, you said there hasn't been much innovation in baths since like 100 years or, or more. Why is that? Is that because there's not much, not, not many places to go with basically a kind of large bucket of water that people are going to sit in? Or is it because people haven't really thought about it and it hasn't kept up with material technology or technologies or new or new ways that people might want to use water in the home i think i, I think there's a, a lot of answers to that question one is materiality right like using white tech uh, or white tech plus is you know this type of material allows you to do phenomenal things and there's some there's some really beautiful sculpted tubs out there i mean within the devon lineup or within other lineups you know that stuff exists i mean that's not we're not innovating that respect per se, but um, I don't think anybody's ever approached uh, the market sector from the standpoint of how do you rationalize multiple designs, reusing singular parts to create very different aesthetics, right? Um, there, I think there's solutions out there that uh, are single body. I mean, like to your question, we could have very easily made a mold in which this thing was uh, one piece, right? One, one monocoque type unit. Uh, but it, from a business standpoint, it wouldn't necessarily be as smart, right? We're not um, amortizing the, the cost of the tooling as far out as we could with this other idea, right? Because then we're having smaller tools, smaller volume, um, more flexibility. And so I think that, you know, as far as I know, and, and Marcus, I'm a lot like you. I'm, you know, this is my first time playing in the bathtub world, bath world in general. Uh, but we, in all the research we did, we never saw somebody who was approaching it from, from this POV. Uh, Nicola, this, these particular products, what do you expect your clients to be? Will they, will they be, they all go to hotels or will you also have domestic customers? Will, will they go to um, uh, holiday homes? Where do you expect to sell them? Through showrooms, through mass orders? Well, actually, the, the modular approach adopted with uh, the design with, uh, with Daniel was meant to address different configurations to different businesses. So uh, there are uh, versions that we are sure will work better and will be more focused and oriented to the contract business for the hotel business. Hotel business. Uh, at the same time, once you are able to play with the accessories, such as the marble plinth, definitely that we are not expecting to see that much in, in, in hotels, maybe in, in some of the nicest rooms, nice but hotels. In, a, in a way they are much more addressed to uh, a residential, high-end residential use. So uh, the, the important aspect is that uh, we are able to decline it and to give interpretation to the product 
for different in, uh, kind of destinations. And I think that the, the images that Daniel used in his presentation, the last three uh, pictures, uh, were pretty much oriented in, in, in that way. If you think one might be a nice villa here in Tuscany, or in the Devonshire, <laughs> well, one, one, it's nice uh, residential uh, place in, in uh, with a more modern approach, I would say, in design down in New York City. The other one could have been uh, easily uh, another room. Could they be used outside? Say it again, sorry. Can they be used outside? In the no. garden, on the terrace? <laughs> No. Can't. I don't think they, they can't be used outside, can they, Nicola? No. No. Okay. Daniel, well, tell me a little bit more about the, <laughs> tell me a little bit more about the product team at Gensler. You, the team sits within a, an architecture firm, but is yeah. your your work for external clients, or does it often come from within the architecture practice itself? No, we don't. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question is that we don't, you know, I don't personally get involved in any kind of like custom millwork for, you know, a professional services firm or something like that. I mean, ultimately, um, the, the product development, what we call product development practice area is a standalone studio that we've got, you know, people in New York, DC, Chicago, Portland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles and Houston. Um, and, uh, it's always client-based work, you know, somebody like Devin or uh, Fantoni or Stylex, the other examples that I showed you, where it's a, a brief driven project, you know, whether or not we're creating or co-creating the brief or uh, companies are coming to us with briefs or we're, we're frankly just pitching ideas to a company because of, you know, let's just say JP Morgan Chase comes to us and says, hey, you know, hey we want blah, 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 or Google, you know, whatever client we're going to talk about. Um, comes to us with a need, recurring need within their workplace that we're seeing trends. And then that helps us inform products that ultimately we're gonna, uh, you know, co-develop with a, with a company and bring to market. But it's not, it's never something that's done internal to us. We don't manufacture, we don't uh, distribute it, we, do, we don't do sales, we don't market products itself, um, but yeah. And give me an idea of the range of different products you work on. This is the first time you've done bathtubs, but what other things would you typically be working on? Oh, we've done. Um, I mean, it's this is this is the this is the really fun thing about working at Genzer is that we touch we literally touch every typology of product you can pretty much imagine, right? So everything from, I mean, if you talk about interior spaces, literally everything from the ceiling to the floor. And so we've got we've done a lot of lighting work, we've done a lot of carpet work, you know, we've done a lot of desking work, chair work. Um, uh, we have certain voids in our portfolio, you know, task chairs, for instance. We haven't developed a task chair yet, which I'm excited to do. Um, yeah, bathroom accessories, um, accessories, not tubs and stuff like that. So, uh, textiles, glass, tiles. Yeah. Everything. Literally everything. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, totally. And Nicola, Devon and Devon, is it, is it normal when you're developing a new product to go to an external design company? Do you have your own designers or do you look around the world and choose different people every time? How does that work in terms of developing new design ranges? Yeah, uh, for 30 years, for the first 30 years of the company, uh, it was not uh, typical to, to, to work with external designers. But we thought that we, we were closing a circle in a way. Uh, the company was started from two architects and in the 30th year, we started a collaboration with two very important internationally recognized architectural practices. And uh, it was uh, really uh, an important selection uh, in about Gensler and, and the other practice, uh, because um, we decided to open in the moment that we, we were sure that uh, our image and brand perception was really strong. And once you, you feel strong, you are able to, to open to, to others. So this has been our, our approach. And what Dana was just saying, their capability to work on different materials, on, from everything, he said, from, from the rooftop to, to, to the flooring, was very, very important for us. Because it, it, it's something that was connecting Devon and Devon and Gensler. 
as I told you, uh, Devon and Devon uh, uh, is working on every single detail within the room and having someone able to understand this approach, such as Daniel and uh, his colleagues, was fundamental for us. So we carefully selected uh, the answer. And for both of you, tell me what are you, what are the trends that are informing bathroom design today? I mean, Daniel, you went for this kind of art deco or you called it a streamlined modern look, but what are, what are customers looking for in, in bathrooms? What are the new things that they're asking for? How are bathrooms changing? Is sustainability a big issue? It's a big open question, but what's new in bathrooms and what's coming up? I can, uh, I'll answer from my side. I mean, my, the majority of feedback that I get within my sort of ecosystem at Gunzer is all super reactionary right now to COVID, right? And so um, it's touchless everything. Uh, which is an in in interesting shift. And, you know, before it was right, it was still, you know, in the contract world, I'm not talking about in the hospitality sector per se, uh, but it was strongly grounded in this in idea formally about, you know, water conservation, sensor-based taps and, and stuff like that. And uh, I would say over the last three months, I've asked, I've had more requests uh, from different design directors, design principals around the firm to investigate all these other uh, touchless systems, whether or not it's going to be touch-free lavatory doors or obviously improving upon touch-free systems for faucets. Um, that is where, at least in the contract market, the world that Gensler typically plays in is the largest driver that we have right now. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of forecasting that, you know, as we, um, you know, at least in America, we're not really quite returning to the workplace quite yet. I mean, we, we are starting to see some openings, but we're going to see a lot of renovations happening in that sector purely based on, on that, fun, you know, performative functionality. But that's, again, in the contract space, not necessarily in the hospitality space. Although I do think that within the hospitality world, we're going to see a lot of the same stuff kind of trend out in terms of um, the same requests. Yeah, we've been hearing the same thing from all kinds of architects and designers that we've been talking to. But what about from your point of view, Nicola? Well, I, I would divide the, the design aspects from the technical aspect. Design-wise, uh, you mentioned the, the, the streamlined modern. Uh, this is something that we are deeply investigating in Devon and Devon in a, due to our research for let me say classical or modern classical archetypes. Uh, um, as I was telling uh, at the beginning, uh, we, we look after rooms that can be lived in time. Uh, and we, 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 we find uh, that uh, yeah, the, the classical lines uh, or the classical language, it means uh, that we, we are able to to, to uh, create rooms and environments that will last for a longer time. And this is somehow related to the second part of uh, my answer. So uh, what is the technical aspect? Sustainability, this is what we are asked for. Uh, and uh, sustainability means uh, make the comparison uh, with, with other fields of design, the fashion industry. Uh, I think it was Armani saying that we have to go back to a slow design. Well, this is very much in line with a, uh, with a theme of sustainability, because it means that the product will be there for a much longer time, not sensible uh, and affected by a continuously changing trends. Uh, once you give that promise to the customer, of sustainability, you have then to work on materials. And being part of a group that is specialized on ceramics, uh, uh, and being ceramics one of the uh, most durable uh, materials with uh, uh, incredible performances for the hygiene, it means that we are able to, to work on the technical side, taking advantage of uh, the internal knowledge uh, about that materials. So I would say design for us declined in our own way, but also a deep look and a very strong attention to whatever is technical, bringing a product to live longer and giving the possibility uh, uh, 
uh, to have this high attention on the hygiene that is very typical of this age, I would say. And finally, I'm sorry, go ahead, Daniel. No, I, I was going to say, I think, Nicole, I think you touched on something really important that's a interesting, you know, especially when the this COVID stuff hit, right? It hit right during our design festival, which is why we're doing virtual, right? I mean, I assume this was a, a reactionary measure to, I, I'm, I'm really curious now that we've seen almost, we'll see an almost an entire year of canceled design festivals, which is a, is a huge bummer, I think, for all of us from the standpoint of product launches, seeing, you know, awesome new stuff, getting to travel and see friends from all over the world and, and you know, Milan or Cologne or London, wherever it's going to be. Um, but I do wonder if it's going to have long, longer stand, standing ramifications in terms of what Nicola said about more fashion-based work, where, you know, we've stopped thinking long-term, right? And it's this rush to get more stuff in, in front of people's eyeballs, and we're not thinking um, from a sustainable standpoint and, and, you know, more or less from a design standpoint. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff coming up, but I don't know if we need it all. And that was kind of going to be my final question, also, which was, on the one hand, sustainability has been something that people have been increasingly concerned about for a few years now. And then on the other hand, the COVID-19 situation, as you say, Daniel, has made people rethink how they interact in spaces. It, do you, are you hopeful that these two trends can come together, that we can have more concern about sustainability and, and want less and want more lifelong, long-lasting products? Because there's also the opposite concern is that people become more obsessed with disposability of having gloves that you can throw away and so on and so right. is, is there a chance that this can lead to a profound change for the better? Personally, I mean, I, I hope so. I mean, you know, the interesting thing about, you know, we're this weird place that we're in right now, and you mentioned like, you know, rubber gloves and stuff like that, is what the, the sustainability backstory is between all these products that we're now being asked to, to put into projects, you know, what's the afterlife of them? Um, I'm not really sure, you know, I, I'm not a material scientist, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not, but I'd be really curious what the afterlife is a lot of these products that are bleach cleanable because they have to be so robust, you know, are they in fact at the end of the day fully recyclable in the same way that some of the other ones? And, and I, I truly believe that they are because most of the companies that are pushing these things out are, you know, well-minded organizations. Um, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question because we're going to see, you know, the, I, I personally believe we're going to see this phased approach where, you know, for a while people in the beginning of this is the desk is dead, right? And so what happens to all this aftermath of the desk? I think we've moved past that and we'll see a, a phased approach that's going to happen over time where we're doing these incremental shifts of bringing more and more people back as we see a solution come out. But I don't know, Nicole, if you've got something else. No, I, I think uh, yeah, in a way, there are uh, products and items in which there is an increasing need for durability. And this has to balance uh, uh, the, the increased uh, quantity of uh, products, uh, such as a mask <laughs> and all these things that you, you have to, uh, to throw away. Uh, uh, definitely, what, what is it? Uh, in important, uh, I think, is that for, for the bathroom environment, uh, we have to consider that they are becoming more and more uh, a safe place where each user is uh, really uh, alone and by, by himself. And, and again, it's, it's a real place where we have to look for durability and sustainability uh, of, the, of the products. <laughs> Kind of a uh, refuge, safe place, how, how do you call it in English? <laughs> where where you, you forget all that word outside where you throw things away and uh, gloves and masks and all that stuff that we are now forced. Yeah, a refuge or, or a retreat. A retreat. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, I've, I've um, in the last couple of days, left my retreat and come back to the office. As you were saying, people are gradually getting back. There is, there's been five of us in the office here today. So it looks like things are returning to some kind of normality. And it's been great speaking to you both, Daniel and Nicola. Thank you so much and good luck with the, with the new products.